minutes anyway. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Closest to the podium. Pardon? Put your water closest to the podium. Your water's over there by your bag. Okay. Did we get a full room? What? Did we get a somewhat full room? <laughs> yeah. Why are there so many people here? <laughs> Go away. Careful when you uh, walk that way too. Your hand the projector. And when you walk that way. Walk oh, never mind. Someone else was walking in front of it. <laughs> you like walked at the same time, and I thought you were catching the bottom. And that makes sense. But he said not to go past that line. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a really janky setup if you were close. <laughs> All right. Should we get going? Okay, we're gonna start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk, Red vs. Blue: The Untold Chapter. Can you uh, hear Tom? Okay, through that. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. You can? Okay. All right, talk a little louder. Just put it in my mouth and... Okay. <laughs> Deep throat of my kite. All right, so uh, yeah, like Tom said, welcome to Red vs. Blue, the untold chapter. Um, we're going to go really quick here because we got a lot of content to get through, so uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. Starting off, my name's Aaron Herndon. I'm a penetration tester for Rapid7. I focus on social engineering, red teaming, and IoT stuff. Um, for IoT stuff, I'll be work, doing a workshop from 12 to 3 in the village if anyone wants to come do it afterwards. So it's uh, really fun. Come join it. Um, blog, Twitter, I hardly ever post things, but I can always be reached through them. Uh, my name is Tom Somerville. I'm a security professional here at a manufacturing company in the West Michigan area. Kind of a uh, all around, you know, one man infosec team kind of guy. Uh, I don't really do any type of social media, so you'll never see me on there. Uh, but if you do want to get in touch, you know, meet me in person and I might give you some contact info. All right, so a quick overview on our talk. Um, the whole talk focuses on a single attack chain, and it's taking us through a simulated network, jumping through the initial entry, pivot, or, uh, establishing persistence, and then pivoting. And the reason we came up with this talk is we were sitting at a bar, going back and forth for a couple hours. Uh, I was recanting all the kind of cool stuff I've been doing on red teams and internal network pen tests. Um, and Tom's like, really? No one sees that stuff? And you know, some people see things, some don't. And he's like, well, I would catch it this way. And we went back and forth with, well, my attack would evade your detection because I'd do this. And it was a never ending conversation. So we just decided, let's make a simulated network and do it. Um, and then we decided a talk would be fun to do with it since we put all the work into making our little simulated network and testing things. Okay, so uh, in addition to what Aaron just said, we're really focusing on using a small tool set. Uh, in fact, we only are really using one uh, paid for tool. Uh, we're also using some other tools that everyone has, such as like mail server logs or firewall logs. Uh, so even though this might not be the most full in depth investigation or hunting that you would do if you were doing some red blue exercises, uh, the goal here is that uh, if you are an organization that's just starting this out uh, and you need to kind of figure out how to tool up um, and just kind of give you an idea of what you can do with just one primary tool. And uh, to add into that real quick, for the red team side, some of the stuff we're gonna be doing is pretty basic. We're leaving some intentional cookie crumbs out there. It's maybe not what I exactly do on a normal red team, but uh, we wanted to toe the line and see what we could do without getting detected um, by automatic alerts, but you know, requiring some triage, so. Okay, and then lastly, the environment that we're working in is uh, fully patched Windows 10 using Next Gen AV with an EDR. Uh, it's behind a Next Gen firewall, and uh, the server is fully patched 2012. So these attack techniques are not using exploits. Um, they are using just uh, more of a configuration vulnerabilities where other than technical bugs to get into the network. For the most part. All right, so uh, we're going to start, and it's uh, late Wednesday afternoon is the premise of our talk here. And so we need to do some reconnaissance, and so we're targeting a company, Bezink is our, uh, you know, target here. We're going to do some OSINT, we're going to look at Aaron Records, find out their IP address range that they own, go to Shodan, see what ports are open, LinkedIn, connectdata.com, look for document metadata, try and grab their usernames, employee information, do some active reconnaissance, um, some NMAP, DNS brute forcing. So DNS brute forcing basically, uh, you know, take the domain name bezinc.com and just fire mail.bezinc.com, ftp.bezinc.com, do all of that to try and get hits on what they might be using for different mail servers, mail server 03.bezinc.com. 
Um, by doing that, it helps us kind of map out their surface out there. And the result is, does Bezink even do business, or are they such a hidden shell company? Um, you know, it's a company we just made up, so obviously they really don't have much out there because we're cheap. And uh, so the one thing we did find was Office 365. Uh, did a spoof check to see if we could spoof email for their domain, and we noticed the SPF records contain the SPF protection outlook.com, which means O365 is in use. Um, nothing else was really worth, worth targeting, though. Fun fact about Office 365, though, ActiveSync allows user enumeration through it. So I can take a list of usernames and try and figure out which are all valid or emails. Another fun fact is those O365 logs are pretty hard, from what I've heard, to triage and keep track of password spraying. Sure, you can do account lockouts or excessive uh, or, uh, logins on a single account, but if I spray slowly against a bunch of accounts over a period of time, it's usually not tracked as much. So uh, we're going to do some password spraying. First thing, I need to build a user list. Like I said, there wasn't much th through OSINT on LinkedIn or ConnectData.com because, you know, it's not a real company. Um, so I took Burp Suite. Burp Suite is a CO2 module, lets you generate using census data. Uh, last name, first initial, generate about 10,000 um, potential usernames, appended at bezinc.com to the end of it, and then we password spray it. And so we use Office 365 usernum.py. Uh, Oliver Morton wrote this. It, he came up with the vulnerability, found it in ActiveSync. He wrote a little tool to do some uh, enumeration here. And as you can see, we found you know a valid user was hit. If it's a 401 response code, we know it's valid. If it's 404 not found, it's invalid. Um, 401 unauthorized means I had valid creds, but it was two-factored. And 200 OK means I'm in, I have email access. So we start doing some password spraying, and we had our valid users, then we sprayed them with invalid users, and it uh, turns out this Payne C guy, uh, Chris Payne, had a really weak password, um, summer 2018 exclamation point. So, you know, crappy password, what a scrub. Uh, so three cheers of summer 2018, and this is something that happens all the time. We're not making this up. This is such a common password. I quit. Um, <laughs> so now that I have email access, now what? What am I going to do with that? I'm going to grab a copy of the global address list. So I'm going to use Ruler to dump that. And then I'm going to search for sensitive information. Ruler can do that for me as well. Um, try and find VPN certificates, passwords, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, after that, I still want internal network access. And I didn't find any way in his email. There wasn't like a cert I could get to get on the VPN. There wasn't any instructions on third-party portals I could access with his creds. So I'm going to go spear phishing with a scope and laser and harpoon gun. Uh, what I mean by that is instead of just sending spear phishing to the gal that I just dumped uh, and using, you know, employee titles, I'm going to take a legitimate email thread from their um, organization and I'm going to look for, okay, this is a good one that I could put an attachment into or I could make uh, someone take an action on and download an attachment and execute something. So we saw that uh, Chris Payne's apparently retiring because he's getting pretty old, so he had an email for this um, retirement party, him and Paul Melson, and uh, they just banked it over at Target, so they're good now. And... Uh, <laughs> So out with the old and with the new, we found this retirement celebration. And uh, so we searched and got it, and we decided, okay, an MSHTA payload or HTA payload will be perfect here because people love to download, like, little evites that have the cute puppy, and they're going to click on it and enable Flash Media or something like that. So what's, you know, the next step for them downloading and clicking run on a HTA prompt? Um, some assumptions, like Tom said, we're running next-gen AV. Uh, I usually assume this, that some, they have it at that point. App locker running, execution of unsigned binaries. PowerShell might be disabled or heavily logged, so I don't want to call it directly. Windows 10 with attack surface reduction, so I can't just use macros and DDEs. That's why I want to go with the HTA route. Uh, can, for friends, you know, code execution, out of those macros or DDEs. Um, so leaves me with HTA at this point. And HTA overview, it's a standalone application using the same technologies of Internet Explorer but it's uh, it run by Microsoft MSHTA.exe utility, and it doesn't have sandboxing. So I can call JavaScript to execute a shell. Um, I can you know, it, make it run um, VB script inside of it, but I can, it's written in HTML. So on the right there, the picture, you see the evite that I came up with, um, pretty much looking like it was from the email. And inside this payload, I have a few different steps or a few different layers. I really didn't need to go this in depth to make it actually execute, but I've learned that the more layers you add, the more you can use next gen AV, and it helps get around it. So uh, inside the HTA, I got some C sharp to do at my actual payload, um, some batch, which is going to compile that C sharp locally on the box, and then an HTA again to deliver and execute it. So looking at that C sharp code, this is the evite.cs code I had put in there. Um, it uses a system management automation library, which lets us call PowerShell commands without actually calling PowerShell.exe. This is what PowerShell.exe uses to do its execution. Um, and then we also use install util, so there's an uninstall class in there. And install util is a Microsoft signed binary, meaning when I run it, I can run unsigned executables at this point, because it's running under the context of install util, so it looks like Microsoft's running my code. Um, and so you just have to put that class in there, and that's what it's invoking my main payload. Bypasses app locker, it's great. And also, next gen AV doesn't catch it as much anymore. 
Uh, so I wanted to, I could just download that exe from the internet, but then it would have um, a flag on it saying it was downloaded or it was written to disk. But if you compile it locally with csc.exe, it looks like a developer made it. And uh, so a lot of tools then can't check it out. They don't flag it as much malicious because it doesn't look like you download it. It looks like it was created locally, compiled locally. So I wrote a small uh, batch script to just go through, find csc.exe, find the automation libraries that I needed, find install util, and then compile it. Um, with the library references I needed, and then execute it with install util. This is what the uh, HTA looks like inside, outside of all the HTML code that made it pretty. This is the meat of the payload. Uh, I had a base64 function, or base64 decoding function in there. I took that C-sharp file, and I took that uh, batch file. I base64 encoded both of them, stored them as variables inside the HTA, and then I decoded them and wrote them to files, and then I called the batch file using wscript.shell to execute my payload. And so this is the phishing email we used after that. It's the evite phishing email landing page. Um, it's basically, I put a little link in there and I had reached out to everybody, you know, on that email distribution list and said, hey, by the way, you know, you got invited, but we didn't send out the evite. I need RSVP so I know how many are going to founders. Please click on this link to RSVP now. And so they were, they go to a website. I didn't want to put the HTA directly in the email though, because it is technically a uh, executable. It's like putting a batch script in there that's going to get flagged, uh, or a VB script that's going to get flagged by email. I didn't want to also put the link directly to the script, because then if they were using like um, Microsoft ATP and it was checking the links and then downloading that attachment, that would get flagged as well. So instead, I sent them to a fake site which is my evite clone site, and it says click here to open invitation, which starts the download and it pops up and it's basically just a little window that says uh, Microsoft's HTA utility would like to run this application and they click OK and then it all runs and they get their fancy little evite where they can click yes or no and I get my shell. Excellent. Okay, so that's what Aaron was up to on uh, Wednesday evening uh, and I'm going about my business, you know, sleeping and uh, I come into work on Thursday morning and go about my morning routine. So what does that look like? Uh, well, part of my morning routine is just do some routine screen creators. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything up here. Just take a look, take a picture. Um, but uh, if you are scanning this list, you're going to kind of say, well, if I run those types of queries in my network, you can get nothing but false positives and non-malicious activity. So uh, a little disclaimer with this is that uh, when you're doing any type of hunting or blue teaming exercises, uh, when you're doing these types of queries, you need to have a deep understanding of what normal looks like on your network so that you can uh, exclude those from your query searches. So, uh, as I said, part of that uh, routine string query, uh, as you saw, part of that routine string query is going to be uh, taking a look at the use of known binaries that will bypass app blocker. Uh, right here at the bottom of the previous page, you can see where I get that list from. Uh, Installutil.exe is one of those. Uh, and I know that this uh, binary is sparsely used on my network. In fact, uh, no legitimate use to my knowledge. Uh, so I take a look at this, and uh, I see here that uh, Installutil is invoking evite.exe uh, on a workstation here. Uh, and this is abnormal for my network, so I'm going to take a look and uh, kind of figure out what this is and where it came from. So I do a string query for evite.exe, uh, and I can see here that csc.exe, which is uh, Windows uh, C Sharp compiler, uh, has compiled this executable locally on disk. Uh, and you can see the command line argument here that created that compile. Um, I don't know where that CS code came from. Uh, this individual is not a developer. Uh, and I also don't know what invoked this command line argument to do the local compile. So I grab the parent process ID of that previous log and I throw it in. And I can see here that there's this bat file called evite.bat. Uh, and that's where uh, the compile came from. So I answered one question, I got another one, where did this bat file come from? So I use the same process, and I grab the parent process of that previous log, uh, and I can see here that mshta.exe is uh, what created that bat file. Uh, now, uh, if you take a look, we got requirement party evite.hta in the user's downloads folder, uh, and uh, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a legitimate use of HTA, so if I kept going down that uh, App locker bypass list, HTA would have also been on it. Um, the only reason I found it via install util is because, you know, um, I just do it in that order. <laughs> okay, so I grabbed the parent process here, and it uh, looks like we found the source of that HTA file and all the subsequent event logs here. Uh, and if you can look, I can instantly see it's from Chrome, and we have the URL that the file was downloaded from as well. Uh, in my environment, we use uh, safe links, which will scan uh, all of the URLs, which is why Aaron did not give a direct URL link. Um, so I can immediately know that, uh, hey, this email came, uh, this link came from an email. 
So I'm going to grab that URL, I'm going to hop over to Office 365, I'm going to throw it into a content search, and this will give me every single email in my mail server that contains that URL. Uh, and then here you can see it gives me a nice little display. I can see that phishing email that was sent out. Um, don't know it's a fish yet, but, you know, kind of got a hunch that I'm going down that path. Uh, and I can download the item, and if it had attachments, it'll give me the original attachments, uh, and then I can get the mail headers for analysis. So I want a copy of that HTA, so we're going to take a look at that uh, URL here that's in the email from my, uh, from my uh, analysis box. Uh, we can see that the web server is down, so no luck getting the HTA from here. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to throw the mail headers into Microsoft's message he header analyzer. I like to use this because I hate scrolling through mail headers in Notepad. Uh, and I can see here that the message did indeed originate from my mail server. And it's not a spoof message or, you know, just uh, mimicking the display name, that it is actually uh, Chris Payne sending out this email. So I want a copy of that HTA file. And the only place I know that I do have a copy is on that endpoint. So I'm going to use my EDR's remote uh, shell. I'm going to connect to it, go over to C downloads, and I'm going to download a copy of that HTA for analysis. Uh, but while I'm here, I'm also going to go over to C temp and grab evite.cs, evite.exe, and that evite.bat file that I saw in the previous event logs. And when I get here, I'm met with a lovely surprise. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a lot more files in this C temp folder that I was previously led to believe. Uh, I, I especially love that folder called pivot there. Um, so while I'm here, I'm just going to download everything, uh, keep it to the side, and we're going to take a look. Now, uh, you'll notice that I'm investigating suspicious activity and I connected to an endpoint. Uh, and you need to be very careful when you do this. Uh, you do not want to pass credentials to a host that might be compromised. Uh, my EDR with a credential as shell, so I'm not actually passing credentials. Uh, so if the attacker is looking or listening for credentials on the box, uh, he's not going to get any. Uh, if you are doing that type of investigation, you be very careful that you use uh, maybe your help desk remote assistance software if you don't have a credential as shell. Uh, a lot of those don't use credentials. Uh, but if you do have to pass creds, uh, use creds that are local to the box laps. All right, so um, now I don't know what your schedule looks like, but we're a small team and uh, I don't have a lot of time. I still got projects and, you know, policy violation reports to write up and that fun stuff. Uh, so I do not actually um, manually reverse engineer all the binaries and stuff that I get from every single phishing email. Uh, but what I do is I'll just chuck them up into hybrid analysis and I'll let these guys... Uh, do the heavy lifting for me to give me a lot of indicators. Uh, however, I am going to take a look at some of the other files here. Um, this C-sharp code here is a great opportunity to take a look at what that uh, EXE is actually doing. And uh, as you can see, this is the code that Aaron showed us earlier. Take my math homework up top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm not a full-time programmer. Um, and Bends. But uh, if I take a look at this code, it took me a grand total of like one minute to realize that this is uh, no sane programmer wrote this. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that it's clearly an attempt at obfuscation. Uh, the, the main, there's two main points here that I've identified up at the top. As Aaron said, it's just nonsensical math. Uh, and it doesn't actually appear to be doing anything useful. Uh, and then the other big point here is down at the bottom, you can see two base64 encoded variables split up into two. And then the immediate next line of code decodes those two variables, concatenates them together, and those two encoded variables are never referenced again. Um, that's not a common programming technique that my developers use. Uh, <laughs> Optimization. Yeah, yeah, very efficient. So, uh, so here's that best joke ever. So uh, I've got my own scale as to how to measure obfuscation. Uh, I can tell that your code is obfuscated. It's clearly elementary. Uh, and if I can't tell that your code is obfuscated, well, cr crickets. Okay, you know, get it now? Okay. She told me not to put it in. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to move on. We're going to take a look at those other files. Uh, we had ssh.vbs, which I haven't looked at yet. If I take a look, it looks like it's using ssh.exe to create a shell out to a remote IP address. So I'm going to write this IP address down as another indicator, along with that domain that I had earlier, uh, as well as the file names and hashes that we've seen. Uh, and then we also have uh, cdmp.ps1, which is a PowerShell script. Uh, and if you take a look at this, anyone familiar with PowerShell Empire Project is going to immediately recognize this as the Chrome Dump script. Uh, straight off their GitHub, completely unedited and fully commented for me to easily identify. Uh, and then uh, I really start to sweat here uh, when I look at cdmp.txt. It looks like we have plain text creds on our hands. So it looks like that Chrome Dump was successful. 
Uh, and for those of you about, we're curious about hybrid analysis, not that we need the report to identify this as a malicious fish and a malicious activity, but uh, uh, AV detection, not a single AV marked it as malicious, and uh, hybrid analysis gives it a 45 out of 100. So suspicious, but not malicious, uh, might get past a team that's too busy to bother. Okay, so uh, I've identified it clearly as a malicious uh, fish, and I want to clean up this point of ingress. Even though the website's down, uh, still early in the morning, there's plenty of time for the users to get click happy uh, and pop up more shells if the attacker decides to bring that back up. So I'm going to connect uh, uh, Security and Compliance Center in Office 365, uh, and I'm going to do a mail purge on that content search I performed earlier. This mail purge is actually going to remove those emails from all of my users' mailboxes, uh, and there's... So no more relying on sending an email out to all staff saying, don't click on that phishing email, and kind of just crossing your fingers that they don't click on that phishing email before they actually read your warning. Okay, so uh, I know rogue employees happen, um, and uh, some of you guys may actually work in an environment where rogue employees are a serious threat and concern. Um, I don't. Uh, and I never actually start to assume by, I uh, never start by assuming that my employees went rogue and they're sending malicious phishing emails out. Uh, and I rather kind of start with the assumption that their account was leveraged without their no, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, compromised credentials. So I'm going to try to confirm this hypothesis by going over to uh, Office, Office 365 sign in logs, uh, which are actually stored in uh, Azure Active Directory. So I'm going to pop over to Azure Vector Directory. Uh, I'm going to download the uh, sign-in logs here. Uh, this is going to download it into a C-sharp script, uh, uh, not C-sharp, a uh, CSV file for me. My mouth is getting dry. All right, and this is what the, the, those sign-in logs look like straight from Office 365. Some things that are going to be useful here are going to be uh, timestamps, uh, usernames and user accounts, uh, IP addresses, sign-in status and failure reasons, and user agent strings. So, like all of you sitting here, I'm way too lazy to scroll through and kind of filter through those logs myself manually. So I wrote myself a PowerShell script to do it kind of for me. Uh, this script here is going to dig through those, uh, that CSV file. It's going to pull out every single IP address that has more than 10 authentication failure attempts uh, and more than one user account associated with those failures. Then it's going to reiterate through all those logs, pull out the successful authentication logs for any IP address that is matched, uh, and it's going to present to me the user account that did have this successful log. Uh, now I have uh, some IP addresses that I want to throw through my EDR that I know are password spraying my uh, Office 365 portal. And if there are any user accounts that have successful authentications, you can take a look in possible compromised accounts. So if I run this script, you can see here that we do indeed have a successful hit. Uh, and I know this is blurred out because uh, I ran this after the, <laughs> after the simulation. and uh, but. The uh, IP address comes from the attacker, and we do have paincfbezinc.com. So it looks like my hunch is correct. Compromised account. So I'm going to go clean that up. I'm going to reset the user's account in Active Directory. I'm going to revoke all session keys from Office 365 to force all applications and uh, uh, services to re-authenticate with that account after the password reset. Send over, take it over to the help desk with that Chrome dump script to help the end user reset all those compromised credentials. I'm going to review the mailbox rules to see if the attacker set anything up, spot check has sent email blasts, uh, and spot check activity logs in Office 365. Just to make sure there's any, any additional suspicious activity I need to review. Uh, when I did so, uh, nothing much, so let's move on. Back to mapping out the rest of that activity here. Uh, so. Uh, as the method that I used earlier is manually querying and relating the parent and child process IDs um, by hand, uh, well, by computer, and uh, that's very tedious and I'm way too lazy to do that. And that's why tooling for incident response, threat hunting, or blue teaming, um, this is where that limited tooling comes in that I was talking about. Where you spend your money matters, and you're going to want to spend it on things that uh, get you most of the way with the least amount of tools and the least amount of time. So uh, my EDR comes with this uh, wonderful process tree view. All I have to do is right click on the event log, hit set, draw process tree, and it does all of that manual work that I was doing earlier for me. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, here you can see that uh, installutil.exe is the focus after that initial parent tree process. And on the right hand side, we get all of the parsed out event log details that we were looking at in the raw event logs. Uh, so this is that initial log that started it all. Uh, and we can see that the HTA is the uh, executable here that created all this interesting activity that started us down this path. If we move up, I can easily see Outlook launched Chrome, which launched the HTA, which launched that file, which did everything. Uh, here we can see the evite.exe being compiled, and here we can see the attacker creating a scheduled task. Um, 
And this scheduled task is called field of pain, and it targets field of pain .vbs. Um, And then here we can see the attacker trying to execute that Chrome dump PowerShell script. We can see the attacker uh, trying to kill a task, uh, successfully killing a task. And then we here that see that uh, Chrome dump script executing again. Uh, but then my events stop, and there's no more activity going on um, within that single process tree. Uh, if I do a quick event query on that install util.exe, uh, you can see here that there is a, a large amount of events that happened last night, um, which is what we had just looked through. Uh, then you see a large period where there are no events for this workstation taking place. Uh, and then we see something popping up again this morning. So um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at what's going on this morning. However, before I do, I'm going to pass it over to the red team here and let Aaron walk you through uh, what we just looked at. All right, so yeah, we're kind of do this a little reverse order. Uh, basically, he's doing threat hunting, and then I come through and kind of show you what he was looking at, um, exactly what I was doing and what I was thinking or drinking. Um, so <laughs> the night before Wednesday evening, I had sent that fish, and I actually sent it around, I think it was like 5 p.m., or I don't know what our timestamps say, uh, somewhere around 5 p.m., thinking Thursday morning maybe I'd get my shells. But uh, nope, I got a shell that night, uh, about 8, 19 p.m. Someone was working from home, apparently. So we were using Empire or PowerShell Empire as our stager inside that C sharp and all that. And so uh, the shell comes back, and I basically have command line access. But for some reason, my Empire modules are all breaking. So all I can really do is run commands against the computer. Uh, but that's okay. I don't want to run the modules anyway. But um, I see that it's running with low privileges. The high integrity zero means low privilege. They're not admin user. Uh, it's you can see it's running under install util there. Um, the IP address also wasn't from Bezink, and that's how I knew it was from home. So the next step is I want to establish persistence as quick as possible, because if they go back to their, uh, you know, and it was also domain join, so we know it was the, uh, the Bezink laptop and not their home laptop. Um, so I want to establish persistence, so that when they take it back into work the next day, that uh, I get on the internal network there. Uh, try to privilege escalate a little bit. Didn't work out. Localhost network reconnaissance. Um, so I'll do all the localhost recon, and then lateral movement and pivoting. So the first thing, I'm going to use scheduled tasks. There's a lot of ways to establish persistence. Like I said, I was trying to do the minimum here without actually triggering a lot of alarms. Um, so scheduled tasks works out. Uh, might not use this as a normal TTP, but there are some APTs that use this kind of method, so go for it. Um, so we create feelthepain.vbs for funds, um, and it is our scheduled task that's going to run a VBS script. I could have just run it directly um, to run my shell every morning, but I would have opened up a Windows command prompt and it would have sat there because it's running in the user context when they're logged in. So uh, instead, I need to do a VBS script so I can hide it because Windows 10 is awesome and command prompts can't be hidden in the background anymore. And then uh, while the laptop's not currently on the Bezink network, I'm still going to do that recon on the local host. So I'm going to look for processes running. I see Next Gen AV. I see Chrome is running. Check for installed software. No exploitable services um, is what I discovered. So I couldn't do local privilege escalation through maybe an exploit there. Um, didn't find any sensitive documents or credentials except for Tom's tax returns. And then uh, I checked for patches. <laughs> like I said, everything was patched. And uh, so we just have our next gen AV running. But what that tells me, two things. One, I bypassed their next gen AV. Hmm, yeah. And uh, the, <laughs> the next thing is tread carefully because they're probably getting a lot of logs. So things to check for in the browsers. Uh, so I uh, said so they had Chrome running. I can dump their stored passwords and then their history to kind of get a mapping of what sites they go to. Do they have any internal applications that this user probably has access to so that I can act like them within their network while still collecting all that sensitive data. Um, so Chrome dump is great to you know go ahead and uh, download get, or extract their passwords as long as you're running as that same user. Um, but I was a little lazy, as he pointed out, and I just downloaded it straight from Empire. I didn't really uh, burn any TTPs by using a custom one. <laughs> so I decided, yeah, well, we'll use Chrome Jump straight from Empire, and it didn't get caught. And the other thing I noticed was um, when testing this on my own against my own next gen AV, whenever you do IEX calls directly to the internet to download and execute PowerShell, it gets flagged. It's just, it's a known, um, it's a known indicator of compromise nowadays that you're downloading PowerShell from the internet and executing. So instead, uh, you know, everyone says, don't touch a disk. Well, I'm going to touch a disk. I decide to drop my PowerShell file directly on disk and then uh, execute it locally. And it didn't flag. Yeah, it worked for me. So uh, Chrome cannot be running when you do this, though. So I'm a jerk, and the person's probably sitting there working at home using Chrome, and I just task kill it. Um, and they probably chop it up to the fact that uh, you know it crashed, you know, it was Chrome. Um, and so when it goes down, they, they can reopen it. But in that time, I did my Chrome dump. It's really not OPSEC safe, but like I said, a standard user might think it's a crash, so I went for it. Um, download my dump files, and I have the domain creds, as Tom pointed out. And they were stored on a text file there, and I had exfiltrated them. But uh, then all of a sudden, I wasn't done, but my shell goes away, and I have no connection anymore. It was 1 in the morning. Maybe they went to bed. Who knows? 
Excellent. So that's what uh, Aaron was up to last night, uh, the other side of the firewall. So we're going to continue our investigation by looking at uh, the activity that's been taking on this Thursday morning. So uh, I take a look and I draw out the process tree for that additional install utility.exe activity. Uh, we can see here that it's still that scheduled task kicked off just as planned, 8, 19 a.m. Uh, and we can see here that the uh, the attacker is creating another scheduled task, but this time pointing to the ssh.vbs script that we reviewed earlier. Uh, here we can see the attacker trying and failing to mount the C drive of a remote computer. So this is our first signs of uh, any type of lateral movement. Uh, it doesn't look like he was successful yet, but uh, he at least has a target and is working towards it. Uh, and then here we can see the attacker getting success there. Now, uh, this might not look like a lot, and it's not. This actually, if we take a look at the timestamps, takes place over a full two-hour period. Uh, in fact, once he creates that scheduled task, there is no activity in this shell uh, for another 40 minutes when he runs ipconfig, and then another full hour after that ipfig command when he starts to try and mount this C drive. So, uh, I don't know where he went, but I'm going to take a wild guess and say that once he got that SSH tunnel up, he probably switched to that, otherwise he wouldn't have wasted his time. Uh, and maybe for better set, more stable connection, not sure, but let's take a look. So I do a string query for that SSH.VBS. It pulls up a couple of different event logs here, but what I'm looking at is the one that... invoking evite.exe on that server. So let's draw that up. And if we take a look at the process tree, note that there are no successful network operations. Uh, in fact, if I go through and I redraw up the process trees for all of the other event logs for install utility.exe, none of them are. So uh, I'm not sure why, but it looks like the attacker here is not having success creating persistence. All right, so we'll switch back and show uh, what I'm doing. And still Thursday morning, we had got that shell. We were working through things. Um, so yeah, like clockwork though, that scheduled task, uh, ran in the morning and I'm shell and I have internal network access. So there's my two dead shells from before. And then, uh, you have my live shell there, which is, appears to be on a different IP address, IP range, and it is the internal Bezinc network. Um, so some common things I'm going to check now on the network. I would already done all my local host reconnaissance. I need to do some network reconnaissance, look at network, uh, connections to internal ranges, figure out file servers. Are they RDP anywhere? Um, are they connecting out to a domain controller? You know, what have they communicated with? What can I use to move laterally and find their other IP ranges without scanning a whole network and giving myself away? Domain name recon is another great one. Um, just take the IP ranges that you find and then just do a reverse IP lookup. And people like, you know, sysadmins are pretty lazy. I was one of them. I was lazy. Uh, we name things like mail dot, you know, internal network, whatever our domain name is, dot com or um, app server 01, uh, prod database, credit card data. And things like that. So <laughs> I find that all the time on tests, and DNS is my friend for mapping out a network. Um, so I searched for that in sensitive documentation on shares. Didn't really have anything, just access to the user share. There was nothing great there. Um, uh, get some service principal names to crack offline uh, through a Kerber roasting attack. Uh, you can look that up later. I'm not going to go into it. And then uh, I'd already extracted all those credentials. So what can I do with the creds that I've already extracted um, and the, you know, the recon that I found, which wasn't a whole lot? Well, when I looked at some VPN or some not VPN, uh, some <laughs> groups for the domain, I had noticed again. This is because you know sysadmins are lazy. They usually correlate group name to server name when they're giving you know users access to a server. So I saw that the uh, user was a part of the group Bezinc-VSIIS01, and during my domain name recon, there was a server VS-IIS01. Um, we're using this because I've seen this active in live environments. So <laughs> it's a pretty common thing to see, actually, users set up just like that. And it tells me that user probably has access to that server in some way, shape, or form. So I need to get to it. Um, so I'm going to create a reverse dynamic SSH proxy tunnel. Um, I can't really pivot through Empire. If I had an interpreter shell, I can maybe do auto route or something and proxy chains through that. But uh, I have Empire. And so um, Microsoft just you know, worked with OpenSSH to create SSH.exe, which is signed by Microsoft. So it's not really looking as malicious anymore. And it works all the way back to Windows 7. That has reverse dynamic proxy tunneling capabilities. So I have a jump box out in AWS. And this jump box is waiting for connection that I'm going to SSH from the compromised laptop 
out to it, and I'm forwarding everything over port 9050 back to the uh, compromised laptop. And anything that goes through that tunnel is then tunneled out to their network. Then I SSH in with my laptop to the jump box so I can connect there, match up 90, I'm forwarding my laptop to 9050 on the jump box and down into their network. And so now I have this tunnel from my machine all the way into their internal network or through that laptop into their internal network. And I can use the tool proxy chains to proxy chain or proxy any of my uh, toolkit all the way through and into that network. So here's, oh, oh, my example slide's gone. Oh, maybe it got moved later. All right. <laughs> this is creating the ssh.exe um, or getting it up there. So I just use invoke rub request to go ahead and download the uh, package. I have to put an ssh key in there as well. Um, that's why it's in a package, so I had to unzip it. And I also, you have to set SSH key uh, permissions because it has to be owned by the user on that box who's using it. It uh, can't be accessible by anyone else. It throws all those errors. So we use iCackles to do that. Um, and then that key, uh, the, <laughs> Tom tried to SSH in with my key to my box. He thought he was a wise guy, but I had it one duo, two factored. He and two then factored. <laughs> <laughs> I two factored my jump box, but it also doesn't even give you a shell. Uh, I had shell capabilities turned off. I could only open port connections, so, and it was an AWS burn box, all you would find is, yeah, nothing. <laughs> so that's a secure way to do it. Don't give people SSH keys back to your C2 infrastructure. You'd be a really bad Russian attacker. Um, <laughs> so you, you, I created the SSH VBS to run it because, uh, you know, I wanted it to um, run in the background, and I thought, hey, if I can do this through a scheduled task as well, then it's going to attach to a child process. It's not going to be running under the context of our compromise, or through our HTA there. So his whole tree breaks at that point, but also if my payload were to go away, my proxy tunnel's still up. And then I create the scheduled task to run every little bit of time. Um, and so this is just quick net stat showing 9050 opening on my jump box and uh, that it is sitting there listening and tunneling through. And oh, here's the example one. This is me using enum for Linux through proxy chains. So I run proxy chains to, um, with enum for Linux and his username and password connect to the uh, domain controller inside his internal network. And this is on my attacker host, which is, you know, a few networks away. Um, and it dumps all the users, groups, password policy, everything I can need to know about their current domain setup uh, that a standard user can grab. And since we have the password for Summerville T and we, you know, thought he could log into that server, we try to RDP into it. So we proxy chains X3 RDP. We get access to it. And uh, we find out he is a local admin on the box, by the way, which is great. That's good for us. Um, so we're also going to use SMB client to, through proxy chains to upload our payload to a new C2 server so we can establish persistence there and get off this laptop. Because our goal is establish persistence, do it throughout their network as much as possible, make it hard for them to try and kick me out. And so I'm trying to establish persistence and run my new payload, and it's not working. I'm not sure what's going on. It's just broken at this time. Um, so I was going to start triaging. Oh, yeah, this is the broken error message. I build error uh, debugging into my payloads because I'm weird. Um, and then, it is helpful. It's also helpful for them, but uh, as long as I clean up the file, maybe not. Eh. It, it was just for that payload. But, uh, so I could spend an hour triaging it, trying to fix it, but I need to move quick. Um, probably set off an alert by this point. I wanted to establish persistence. I didn't get it. What else can I go for real quick? Um, so maybe there's credentials, cache and LSAS. I could try and grab that. Uh, privilege accounts that I can impersonate, but there was no DAs logged into this box. There are no sysadmins, but they're bound to log in at some point, but I'm not going to wait for that. So what can I do now? Um, you know, if I had more time and I wasn't thinking someone's going to be on my trail, then maybe I uh, would wait. But I want to grab sensitive data, didn't find any, and also local account credentials. Can I dump the local admin password? Uh, so that's what we're going to do real quick. We use CrackMap exec just to grab the LSA and then the SAM, which gives us our administrator password there. And oh. Okay, so he's had enough fun on the server, so we're going to give the attacker a boot here. Uh, so, uh, last we left off, I was taking a look and watching his activity in our network from the workstation over to the server. Uh, and I felt like I was getting close to kind of knowing the attacker and being able to profile his type of activity. Uh, I've seen him establish persistence on that workstation a number of different ways, always going to the same IP address. Uh, and then also after he does get lateral movement, I see him trying to reestablish persistence on the server using the same persistence methods. So, what am I going to do here? Uh, first, before I take any action, I need to be sure that the attacker isn't anywhere else in my network. So uh, I'm going to take that IP address that I have seen him working with uh, and only working with, uh, and I'm going to do an event query uh, excluding the known compromised workstation, um, and I get no results. So that's good. It, it kind of you know, gives me the impression that the attacker is solely relying on the workstation still as his single point of ingress into the network. Uh, I'm going to confirm that by moving over to NetFlow and my firewall logs. Uh, and I do this because, uh, as you guys all know, when you tell your uh, ops team to deploy an agent, uh, how many people get 100% deployment every time? 
that's why. Uh, also, he could have moved to some uh, devices such as IoT devices that aren't compatible with my EDR endpoint agent. So uh, uh, I take a look, I put the IP address in the NetFlow, and I can see that there is no additional communication uh, from any other device in the network to that IP address. So my uh, hunch here that I got from the EDR is confirmed. Uh, and if you're not utilizing NetFlow, you can use your firewall logs, which is displayed here as well. Uh, now. I've seen the attacker trying to do lateral movement inside the network uh, over 3389. Uh, and I also know that he's been communicating over 443 and over 22. So I'm going to take a look and I'm going to go into my NetFlow, which we tap off our core routers. Uh, and I'm going to look for any 3389, 22, or 443 traffic from that workstation out to our internal network. Uh, and what I see here is only uh, 3389 traffic from the workstation out. Since this user is not IT, uh, I would expect to see very little of this, and this is confirmed. So. I'm fairly comfortable, so let's go ahead and let's give him the boot. Uh, my EDR comes with a network contained function, which instantly kills all network communication on the workstations with the agent, uh, except to and from the EDR controller. So I can continue log generation and continue using that remote shell for sample gathering uh, and evidence collection. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'm going to network contain the server in that workstation. Uh, and I'm also going to go into my uh, firewall and I'm going to block the fully qualified domain name and the IP addresses that I've seen him using in the past uh, in our network as well. Uh, the goal here is to do this blocking and uh, killing of network activity as close to simultaneous as possible. Uh, if I were to uh, take some action uh, before I fully knew the scope of the breach, uh, you could risk that the attacker gets uh, sees that his shells are dropping. Uh, that credit. <laughs> and uh, kind of switch his focus from gathering intel off the box or information off the box and doing exfils to, uh, to just kind of spread as far into your network as possible and just kind of hide in a corner and hope he doesn't get fully cleaned up. Uh, so you don't want to do that. And like he said, worse, he might decide just burn the place to the ground as he realizes he's been caught. So... <laughs> okay, so uh, post-incident analysis. Uh, you can see I didn't actually get to go through everything and due to time, which this guy told us we're running low on. Um, <laughs> Um, but due to time, we weren't able to, we actually had to consolidate this down to one slide. And, uh, yep, yeah, so here you can see that your uh, EDR is also not just a tool for threat hunting, but can be used for uh, incident response and post-incident uh, post analysis as well. Uh, and you can see the attacker dropping SAM, uh, the SAM logs here, uh, and we're going to try to include that in our cleanup. So here's our summary. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. We talk See? way faster. He didn't believe me when I said you talk faster when you get up on stage. So this guy wanted to rehearse the talk like 20 times. And yeah. <laughs> Red team recap. Um, so progress made. We got into the network. We, you know, they found some weak passwords, uh, which is pretty much an attack chain that we always see probable without using a bunch of exploits is uh, look for weak passwords, find a way to get into a system, use, you know, get in as that user, find a way to maybe exploit that system with their credentials, um, whether it be logging to VPN, go through mail and send the fish. Uh, let's say they had access to a web server and they could maybe, you know, start a task off the web server, use that to get a web shell, something like that. Um, so we look for those credentials, we get access to a machine, we try to find more credentials or laterally move off of that machine to get to another machine to get more credentials and move again. And that, you know, it's, it's a great way to move throughout, uh, just rinse and repeat on using creds and you can kind of act like that user at that point so you're not raising a bunch of red flags running around scanning for MS1710 and dropping it. Um, <laughs> sometimes that works. Some <laughs> Actually, a lot of times that works, but, you know, if we want to just take the creds route. Um, so yeah, we've... Did that, we got in, we got into a server, but he caught up to us pretty quick because, uh, you know, some weird activity and he actually queries for those 26 different app blocker bypasses like a weirdo. Um, I guess it's a good thing. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so blue team recap. Uh, so, as I said in the beginning, the goal of this talk was kind of saying that if you wanted a tool for threat hunting or red-blue type of activities, um, you don't need an array of very expensive licensed software. And in fact, you can get very far with utilizing just one tool, an EDR. Uh, so uh, an EDR is kind of a multi-purpose tool. Not only is it for hunting or blue teaming, uh, blue-red exercises, but it's also very useful in instant response, um, some post-incident forensics. Uh, but it's also going to give you a ton of visibility into your network so you can kind of see what normal looks like so that you can know what abnormal is. Uh, also, other team tools are security tools too. Uh, I know we like to have a lot of tools, um, but a lot of times we are doubling up on what our developers or applications teams or our operations teams already have. Um, even though the GUI isn't optimized for us in the security field, uh, uh, you can leverage those. And you can see here that I am leveraging my NetAdmin's uh, 
uh, NetFlow environment that he uses basically to uh, check network and monitor network health. Uh, so not the same that I have, um, but that what I would pick, but hey, it works pretty well for me. Uh, also, you can see here that I'm, I'm right on the mail server with my uh, sysadmins as well. Uh, also, uh, even if you're a small team like me, or if you have a limited budget, you should still try to put uh, red blue exercise and hunting into your routine security uh, policies and procedures. Uh, procedures. <laughs> Um, you can get a lot of value from it, even if you don't think you're the target of Russia or China. Um, uh, and it's really going to help you learn your network uh, and be better at securing it if you can, uh, if you know all the weaknesses. Uh, and these types of exercises are, are really going to help you find all those vulnerabilities where an attacker can move and where he cannot move easily. Kind of figure out where your detection capabilities are lacking and help you beef those up. Okay, so uh, shouldn't go. I don't know. Uh, we kind of blurred out and corrupt out the name of my specific tool. A lot of you will probably recognize it though. Uh, but uh, something else, if you were watching this slide and you go, wow, that's great, but I simply don't have time. Uh, but I think threat hunting uh, type of activity, this type of activity should be going on in my network. Uh, managed threat hunting services do exist. Uh, and it's something that you can kind of use as a crutch uh, as you, while you wait until you can stand this up in your own environment yourself or if you're like new and you're not confident in your abilities. Uh, my EDR here comes with it. It's not really an a la carte type of thing. So no matter what, I have it. Uh, and you can see here that while it doesn't prov al always provide active protection, uh, you do see that here we get some detection, you know, a day later. But um, I think, you know, late detection is better than no detection. So. There you go. You finish? All right. <laughs> it went pretty well. Yeah, so my EDR is built on top of Splunk, and so the EDR endpoint. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so my EDR is actually built on top of Splunk, and so the EDR agent that gets deployed forwards all the logs to the EDR controller, uh, and I got the full Splunk interface to do my queries. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, you can get open source tools um, that allow you to basically capture those and send them to a logging server. So you can do this, you just, you're going to have to take the time to build it out. Yep. Google's got an open source one that uh, seems pretty interesting. I, I haven't looked too much into it, but it seems pretty capable that you can take a look at. The question was, can you automate log analysis from Office 365? Uh, yeah, so I wrote that PowerShell script to help me with that automation. Uh, and I wrote this before that whole unicorn tool thing that happened with the Microsoft APIs this summer that people were all upset about for some reason. Um, and since that, they do now have this new option to download the, the event log download script. Uh, I've taken a look at it, and it looks like it'll be pretty easy to modify. Uh, to do the query, all I have to do is get the current timestamps, go back seven days from the current system time, and I can automate that. I'm actually working on doing that, and this guy's going to force me to release that on GitHub so that you can just run this as a daily scheduled task or something. Yeah, the, the API he was talking about this summer is called the Activities API. Um, so we, he originally wrote his code to pull all the logs from the Activities API and do this daily by itself. And then Windows, or Microsoft was like, you all love the Activities <laughs> API. We're going to get rid of it. No one knows why. It was an undocumented API, but we were exploiting it. I think maybe that's why they got rid of it. There's a lot of tools we were using to have fun with. <laughs> Go ahead. It was super useful. Yeah, so from red team side, we have seen people run that. Um, grabbing open source tools and going that route, it does require you to understand what you're threat hunting, and that's where he said the red-blue exercises are great. You put those tools out there, but you're never actually testing them. Um, yeah, you get a red team or get somebody to go ahead and make those logs and allow you to threat hunt without knowing what's going on so you can test your tools, see where those gaps are. But open source tools really do work. You just have to put the effort in to build them out. Uh, he went the expensive route with, you know, it, it wasn't too bad for a mid-sized company price-wise, but yeah. still. <laughs> yeah, it was actually surprisingly affordable for what we got, and it also replaced our antivirus solution as well, so doubled up. Uh, but I also did use OSEC before I had my EDR. Uh, while it wasn't as good and it was a lot more work, it does work. And I do know of some fairly large organizations that are doing it through all open source because 
they just can't scale with a solution like this or they just don't want to go bankrupt. So it, it's definitely possible. It just takes a lot more effort. Yes. I'll tell you after the talk. It doesn't really matter. Crowd strike Falcon. We can say it doesn't matter. Right. We just didn't want to say about that bypass is crowd strike Falcon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, any other questions? Cool. Well, we're done. And if you see us, feel free to ask us more questions.